So uh, as was mentioned, I'm a PhD student over at MIT, finishing my PhD this spring. And I work on quantum algorithms and more specifically like quantum machine learning algorithms. And today I'll be talking about something that I've been really interested in recently, which are restricted quantum machine learning architectures. So I'll explain what I mean by that in the talk and why I'm interested in it. If you wanna follow along at home, down at the bottom are a few papers that talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Bobak Kiani over at MIT, and then uh, Han Yi Hu and Jinlan Wan over at UCSD and Shun Gao at Harvard. So a lot of collaborators that went into making all this possible. So thanks to them. All right, so without further ado, um, just to get everyone started, I'll give some background on quantum machine learning and uh, particularly these restricted quantum neural networks, which I'm really interested in. And then I'll you know, motivate why I'm interested in them and get into their expressive power and how, how really useful these things can be. And then finally, I, I know a full on theory talk isn't the most exciting. So at the end, I'll get into some numerics and uh, some nice plots and stuff to make things interesting. So, okay. Uh, why why are these restricted QNNs? So you probably have seen variations of this slide throughout all these talks today and probably throughout the next week. But we're in this era of uh, what are called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices or NISC devices. So these are things like Google Sycamore device or uh, IonQ's IonTrap devices. There's a bunch of these things out there. And they are noisy quantum computers that are pretty small but are starting to do things that are sort of on the verge of classical intractability. So um, it's a very exciting time to be a quantum computing researcher because uh, we get to play with these things, but it's kind of an open question what useful things these devices can do. So uh, you've probably heard that in the far future when we have big error corrected quantum devices, we'll be able to do things like uh, factor large numbers or do unstructured search really efficiently, solve large systems of equations. So these are all proposals that really need, uh, if you want to have any advantage over like classical computers or uh, classical algorithms, you need really large scale quantum devices, which we just don't have right now. So kind of ironically, the thing that we're looking to do with these noisy quantum devices is find use cases for them that essentially use them as little as possible because uh, you know you want to minimize your quantum resources required so you can use these small quantum devices, but still do something interesting with them. So that's kind of what I've been interested in and why I got into uh, these quantum algorithms. And there's one major class of uh, algorithms called variational quantum algorithms that are sort of tailored for, for these devices. And essentially the, the way these things go is you have some function f of theta and whatever problem you're actually interested in, you phrase as the uh, minimization of this loss function. So the canonical example of this is like f of theta is some uh, complicated potential energy surface of a big molecule or something where it's difficult to evaluate this potential energy surface on a classical computer, but a quantum computer could just do a quantum simulation of the system and evaluate it efficiently. So if you have this function that's expensive to evaluate classically, but if you assume that you can efficiently evaluate it quantumly, then what you can do is sort of just use your quantum computer as a black box that outputs these f of theta results. So in other words, what you can do is for instance, uh, have this function f of theta, take a derivative of this function on your quantum computer, pass this information to a classical computer that's operating side by side with this device, and then use that to do gradient descent, and then read out the next gradient from your quantum computer, and then go back and forth. Um, so as you might imagine, a lot of things can be phrased in this way. Uh, this was originally thought of in like 2013 or something, so it's pretty old at this point um, by, by folks over at Bristol and Harvard. So, yeah. 
uh, there's a lot of things you could do with this. And when you hear optimize complicated loss functions and you know machine learning, they kind of you know go hand in hand. So you might ask, okay, can you can you phrase machine learning problems in this framework? And the answer, perhaps unsurprisingly, is yes. Um, again, there are like many proposals for ways to do this, but just as a concrete example, this figure comes from a paper by Eddie Farhi and Hartmut Nevin over at Google. And there, what they're looking at are, okay, let's say you have some quantum circuit, these U of theta, that depend on some classical parameters theta. And then you have some loss function that depends on the measurement statistics at the end of this circuit. But what, what you can do is just optimize this circuit over theta, uh, or optimize this loss function by optimizing over these theta, and then learn some neural network loss function, um, or train on some neural network loss function, and then get, you know, a classifier in this case out, out of this scenario. So I'll, I'll get into more detail later on in the talk, but just at a broad high level, um, you know, just because you can do this doesn't mean necessarily that it's a good idea. So, you know, just because you can run these machine learning algorithms on these quantum devices, it's really uh, the first question you have to ask is, well, are these things useful? Like, is there a reason we would want to do this? Um, and, and when you're thinking about this, there's really two uh, complementary things you sort of have to balance. Uh, and one question you have to ask yourself is, okay, are these quantum neural networks powerful? Are there distributions or things that they can classify more efficiently than the existing classical neural networks out there? And then on the other hand, you also have to balance that with how trainable are these architectures? You know, if they're too uh, generic, it might be the case that they're really not trainable at all. And if you're familiar with classical machine learning, this is sort of an interesting thing to think about because when you're training a classical neural network, um, generally at least, it's almost a given that whatever loss function you're training on is efficient to optimize. Um, but it's not necessarily true that this intuition holds for quantum neural networks. So, okay, we, we can answer these two questions. Um, luckily, the answer for if they're powerful is yes. So. A bunch of results show this in different scenarios, but for instance, uh, some folks over at IBM showed that if you have a classification task and you mask it using the discrete log, so you have some data set that looks kind of random, but if you were to take the discrete log of this data set, um, it looks like a linear classification task. A quantum computer can classify this really efficiently because it can run Shor's algorithm efficiently and then take this discrete log and then classify the data. But to a classical computer, this data just looks kind of random. So it's very difficult to, to classify. So at least in certain scenarios, there are instances where these quantum neural networks are really powerful and useful. But as, as to if they're trainable, unfortunately, the answer, at least generally, is no, they're not. And we can, we can get some intuition for this fact. So. There's really two scenarios one, one considers when looking at the trainability of these quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, one is when these algorithms are very deep or when these quantum machine learning architectures are very deep. And it's been shown a few years ago that when these are deep, uh, the, the gradient, so when you're trying to do gradient descent on the uh, optimizing these quantum machine learning architectures, the gradient concentrates around zero. So uh, if you're trying to do gradient descent and your gradient is very small, it's very difficult to measure this really small gradient on a quantum computer, um, which might have noise or whatever. And so it makes training these models very difficult in practice. And the way I like to think about the optimization landscapes in this scenario are they kind of look like the surface of Tatooine. So if you're trying to do you know, gradient ascent on a lost surface that looks like this, if you're starting at some random initial point when training this uh, machine learning architecture, you'll be in this barren wasteland 
and not know which direction to go in order to maximize this last one, this function. But if you start in the vicinity of some maximum, then, then you can optimize efficiently. So if you know a good idea of where to start, then these things might still be useful. But generically, if you don't know where to start in these uh, optimization algorithms, you're just not going to have a good time. It's just not going to optimize efficiently. So OK, that's, that's for deep quantum neural networks. And then in the shallow case, you don't necessarily have these barren plateaus, these really flat lost landscapes. But instead, what you can get are potholes, I guess you could say, in the lost landscape. So you have all of these local minima that you can get stuck in if you're trying to optimize. So this plot comes with a uh, comes from a paper with Bobak I had, and we we looked at shallow quantum neural networks. And if you're trying to find this global minimum of this loss function, and you're starting at a point way out here, you're just going to get trapped in a local minimum before you can optimize this efficiently. So in the shallow case, uh, it's less like the surface of Tatooine and more like a typical road in Boston. So if you're trying to find a specific pothole in, in this training landscape, you're going to get stuck in some other pothole along the way before you even get there. So even in the shallow case, these quantum neural networks are very difficult to train. OK? So, you know, it's nice that these quantum machine learning algorithms are very powerful, but, you know, it's not, uh, kind of a bummer that they're not generally trainable. But I have a lot of time left in this talk, so obviously this isn't the end of the story. And, and indeed, that, that's the case. The key point is this generally footnote here. So all of these results that I had just mentioned, they prove that these quantum neural networks uh, are very difficult to train generally. But you know, there's hope that if you look at restricted classes of quantum neural networks, that they are indeed trainable. So I'll give examples of this uh, later on in the talk. But um, just, I guess, a quick example offhand. You could have a quantum neural network and optimize over quantum neural networks that are invariant under some symmetries. And Essentially, you're restricting the search space. And uh, by doing this, you, you can actually prove, so people have shown in this instance, in this example, uh, people at Los Alamos have shown that these models are actually trainable. So you can look at restricted quantum models and still have trainable, uh, and then have trainable quantum models. But the key point is once you look at restricted architectures, you have to then balance that with how powerful they are. So again, it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, but that's what makes it so interesting, because you have to kind of evaluate both their uh, expressive power and how trainable they are, and try and find something useful and uh, interesting somewhere in the middle. And another advantage to looking at these restricted quantum machine learning architectures is that they give you intuition when you prove that they're powerful or whatever as to where this power is coming from. So again, later on in this talk, I'll give an example of this. But if you're trying to give a very generic model and your proof of quantum advantage in this scenario relies on like complexity theory, um, you have to argue that to see separations in practice, it should be a very difficult kind of problem that you know comes up in complexity theory, which isn't necessarily always the case when you're trying to train neural networks in practice. So, this is another advantage to looking at these restricted quantum models and seeing where these are useful um, rather than very generic ones. So, OK, this is why I've been interested in these restricted quantum neural networks. And for the remainder of this talk, I'm just going to give very specific, a very specific example of where we're actually able to show that a restricted quantum model is, uh, has some expressive power advantage over classical neural networks. And to do that, we're going to do something that might seem on the surface kind of surprising. Um, we're just going to look at quantizations of linear classical neural networks. So um, if you're familiar at all with classical machine learning, you know that often in the classical machine learning literature, 
when people want to prove or gain intuition as to what models are trainable or powerful or whatever, they often look at linear models. Um, because when you don't have nonlinearities, it's just way easier to analyze these models analytically than otherwise. So quantumly, we're just going to do, do the same exact thing. We're just going to take a linear classical machine learning architecture um, that's linear and, and then quantize it and essentially just see what happens. And we'll actually find that there are things that this very simple quantum model can do very efficiently um, that can be difficult classically. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, let's let's get into this specific example. So, okay, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to be focused on sequence modeling. So very generally, what this is, is you want to sample from a conditional probability distribution. So we have some input sequence X. You can think of this as if you're doing a translation task, like a, a sentence in English. And we want to sample from the distribution of correct translations, again, if we're thinking about a translation task. So just as an example, if this is an input sentence in English, we want to sample from correct Spanish translations of that sentence. Um, so this is one example of sequence modeling that really is uh, focused on translation. But again, this is a very general task when you want to sample from these conditional distributions of sequences. You can also do time series modeling in this framework. So X could be a sequence of past stock market data or something. And you want to sample from the distribution of potential future extrapolations of what the stock market will do. Uh, people use sequence models for that in, all the time. Uh, and, and perhaps most relevant to today are uh, chat GPT, things like chatbots that you give some input prompt X, and then it samples from witty responses Y to whatever prompt you gave it. Um, and unfortunately, ChatGPT has been really busy recently, so I couldn't get an actual response. But uh, luckily, they when it's busy, they have sample responses going, and, and they wrote a nice limerick about how I couldn't get onto ChatGPT. So that was nice. So anyways, sequence modeling is very ubiquitous. Um, and classically, there are a bunch of architectures that, that do this. Because as you might imagine, it's a very well-studied problem. Um, and so the chat GPT is something called a transformer, which I'll get into later. But for now, we're going to focus on recurrent architectures. So these are things like RNNs or LSTMs or GRUs that you might have heard of. Um, and, and the way they're laid out is given by this diagram here at the bottom. So you should think of your architecture as just some trainable function fi. So you're trying to find a function fi such that at each time step, you give it an input word from the input sequence xi. And then it spits out a translation in the corresponding spot of the output sequence yi. Um, and then also writes to some internal memory lambda i. And this internal memory is very important. Because, for instance, if you have in a translation task an adjective at the beginning of your sentence modifying some noun at the end of your sentence, it's not going to remember that unless it has some internal memory. So this internal memory is what keeps track of all of the long time correlations in your translation task or in your model when doing this translation task. Um, and what we're going to focus on uh, quantumly is looking at the case when this fi is a linear function. So a very, very simple model. And then we're going we're gonna to consider a quantum extension of this. So um, when you quantize this classical dynamical system that's just you know, linear dynamics given by these xi, uh, what, what happens when you quantize it is your state space, which because we're looking at neural networks, everything is real valued, um, that will be promoted to like a continuous variable quantum system, so CV quantum system. And uh, that's what's diagrammed here. So, so this lambda i, that uh, latent space of the classical model, gets promoted to this CV quantum system. And then that linear fi, that linear function fi, 
gets promoted to uh, an interaction between this hidden space, this this latent space, lambda i, oops, and, and the input space. So this phi e is just uh, states that depend on the inputs xi, and this u is now some bilinear interaction uh, between lambda i and and the inputs. So just to give uh, a concrete example, we consider a bunch of other cases in our paper, but um, if lambda i initially is some Gaussian state, and these phi i are qubit states that, that come in at each time step, then what this uh, bilinear interaction is, is a James Cummings interaction. So uh, it's okay if you don't know what that is, but uh, it, it comes up when you have like a, an atom in a cavity that it interacts through this James Cummings interaction. Um, so these things people, people look at experimentally, and, and that's kind of the model we're looking at here as a, as a machine learning architecture. So, okay, um, we have this quantization and we call it a contextual RNN. And the reason we call it a contextual RNN is because it's capable of measuring contextual properties of that quantum state lambda i. And if you're not familiar with quantum contextuality, it's essentially the statement that when you're doing quantum measurements, it's not like you're revealing pre-existing classical values for these quantum observables. And I'll, it's probably easier to explain via example, so I'll have an example on the next slide. But just for some context, last year the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for an experimental, for multiple experimental demonstrations of special cases of this fact. So there they were looking at non-locality, which you can think of as a special case of quantum contextuality, but it's a similar idea, so it's very, very relevant. And uh, yeah, let me just give an example so we can build some intuition as to what's going on here. So, uh, okay, we can consider a table of these qubit poly operators, these Z, X, and Y operators. And I've arranged these observables in, the, in such a way where the products of the rows are the identity. And same with the first two columns, they product to the identity. And then this final column products to minus the identity. So, so you can check this just by doing the matrix multiplications. Um, and also each of these rows and columns of operators commute. So everything along this row commutes and this column and so on. And if when you did these measurements in some quantum state, so you measured the operator x1 or y1, y2, and these measurements were revealing pre-existing classical values, then we should be able to assign classical values ahead of time to whatever these operators are. So we can try and do that. We can make a very naive guess initially and say, okay, what if these all were plus one? So plus one valued. But then if we look at the uh, row and column parity checks, we can see that we break this minus one parity relation here. So obviously this isn't the correct classical values for these operators. So we can try and fix that by flipping this to minus one and then have this be our guess. But then we break this uh, parity constraint. So, you know, we, we can keep trying to fix this and, and then look at this one and then try and fix this parity constraint, then we break this one. And it's fairly easy to show that you can generalize this and show that you can't classically assign these values ahead of time. So just to uh, go back to this slide, one way to think about what's going on is that if you, for instance, are trying to measure y1, y2, and you had previously gotten plus one measurements, the measurement of y1, y2 depends on if the previous measurements were along the row, for instance, or along the column. So if we measured this operator and this operator and got plus one, plus one as the measurement results, and then we measure y1, y2, because of this parity constraint, uh, the product has to be equal plus one, this measurement result has to be plus one. But if instead we were measuring along the column and then measured z1, z2, x1, x2, and got plus one each, then this has to uh, give minus one when you measure it. So sort of a very hand wavy way of thinking about it, uh, which 
you know, isn't really rigorous at all, but just some intuition, is that the measurement of Y1, Y2 depends on the measurement context. So whether you're measuring uh, along the row or along the column. And this is really what quantum contextuality is. It's that measurements kind of depend non-trivially on previous measurements you've done. And assuming everything commutes, this can happen over very long times. So it's like a very uh, non-trivial long time correlation that quantum systems sort of naturally possess. Um, and it's just a general feature of quantum mechanics that you know, it's just because quantum mechanics is the way it is. So, uh, right. And I should say that this example was with qubit poly operators, but our system is on uh, the CV quantum systems. And in that case, you can do something similar with uh, displacement operators, if you know what those are. But that's probably getting into the weeds too much. But just know you can you can do these measurements that reveal quantum contextuality in these systems. So, okay. This gives a natural translation task that we can consider where we're given classical descriptions of some input observables which exhibit this quantum contextuality. And the task is to translate that input sentence into measurement values that are consistent with quantum mechanics. So we sort of chosen this task to be a, a, a shoe in for the quantum model because it's just naturally what it does. Um, but in principle, this is some classical translation task because it's classical input descriptions and classical output uh, you know, values. So, so we can consider this translation task. And intuitively, by this quantum contextuality argument, and we prove this in, in this paper, um, you can show that the classical model has to memorize all of these possible contexts um, to output the correct measurement. So in other words, this lambda space classically has to remember exactly what context it currently is in and has to remember this over very long time, potentially, to be able to do this translation task efficiently or, or get it correct. So that, that gives us to our, uh, to our theorem that we prove in the paper, which is that there's this quadratic overhead in doing this task classically versus quantumly. Um, and we also show in our paper that this is asymptotically tight. There are classical simulations of our quantum model that you can do with this quadratic overhead. So it's really just a quadratic overhead that's tight. And I, I put a couple of asterisks here. And this first asterisk is, even though our quantum model is a quantization of a linear classical RNN, which is a very, very simple model, this separation actually holds over transformers and you know, things like ChatGPT, it's very general. Um, and it really is so general because it has to do with just a memory requirement. So uh, the technical details are in this paper. I won't really get into them, but essentially any classical neural network that utilizes an internal memory will have this separation. And then this asterisk just is saying that even though uh, this is only a quadratic separation with a slight uh, modification of the task. We can actually get to a really big super polynomial separation, but then we lose these trainability guarantees that motivated the whole thing to begin with. So yeah, I, I won't get into that. Let's just focus on the quadratic separation here. Um, and okay, with my last few minutes, I'm going to just talk about um, numerical simulations of this because what we showed in this proof and in our paper analytically is that there is some task that we kind of constructed where we have this quadratic memory separation between quantum and classical models, um, even when that quantum model is very simple. But, you know, this is one constructed example. It's not really, people aren't doing this in real life. So we wanted to see if this intuition that these quantum models can uh, store long time correlations in the measurement context of the system, whether that really gave a, a practical advantage on a, on a real world task. So that's what we did. We looked at some standard Spanish to English translation task. Um, because we show that our separation is asymptotically tight, this quadratic separation, 
we can actually simulate our quantum model with quadratic overhead. And so, you know, we go up to 500,000 parameters in these models, which isn't very big, but again, we have this quadratic overhead. So uh, it, it looks more expensive to simulate the model than it actually looks like here. Um, and so, okay, on the Spanish English translation task, um, how well do these models do with this many model parameters? And when the model is this small, as you might expect, uh, classical models don't do very well. 500,000 parameters isn't that many. So these are just random input sentences. Um, and this grew, this classical model just almost never gets it right. It's very bad uh, when it's this small. But when the quantum model is this small, it gets it right actually the majority of the time. Uh, and this isn't very quantitative, this slide. So to be slightly more quantitative, um, we also looked at the performance of this model when um, compared to a transformer. So this y-axis here is the, the loss, the KL divergence. I won't really get into that, but lower is better here. And then we fixed the performance of a, of a given CRNN, one of these quantum models. So that's this dashed line here. And then we varied the size of a transformer and saw where their performances kind of lined up. So, you know, very roughly, given some error threshold you want to achieve in performance, how big of a transformer do you need to meet that of a, of a quantum model? And probably somewhat coincidentally, this crossover happens exactly at this n by n minus three over two that we predicted our proof. Um, the fact that it's like spot on is, again, probably coincidental, but, um, you know, at least roughly, this shows that there really is like a, a very large separation in how how efficient these two models are at, at performing this task. So, okay, just to, to wrap up really quickly, um, what we did was we showed uh, this quadratic separation and showed that these restricted quantum models, which are more trainable than general quantum machine learning architectures, we showed that they can do, thing, do things that uh, are you know, more efficiently than classical models, um, at least constructed scenarios. And in the future, I, I want to push this quadratic separation a little further. Quadratic isn't very big. You know, an n versus that squared separation is kind of meh. But um, I have some ideas on extending this. If we allow for slightly less restricted quantum models, but still restricted enough such that they're trainable, again, it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, so I want to I want to look into that further, um, and something interesting that has come out of our paper is we have this quantum inspired classical model that is really just a simulation of the quantum model we give in the paper, and even though it has this quadratic overhead, that in itself might be of interest to to machine learning people. So I've been talking to a few people about if this is interesting. Uh, these classical simulations of quantum models. And then finally, um, one of the benefits of only using these restricted architectures is that you have fewer operations you have to correct against if you're trying to do error correction, a few operations trying to correct. So looking into you know, the actual resource requirements for doing this in practice, something I want to look into in more detail in the future. So OK, thanks for having me. Uh, Thank Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Eric. Really good presentation. As a Thanks. native Spanish speaker, especially loved your <laughs> slide where you have these <laughs> Spanish expressions. Uh, Do you yeah. speak Spanish yourself? Uh, well, mi madre es de Cuba, pero ah. mi español es muy malo. <laughs> no, that was good. That was actually good. Uh, Oh, hey, thanks. all the Spanish speakers uh, in the chat, let us know. I'd love to see ah. the Spanish speakers we have here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also like the reference to uh, Star Wars. So ah, yeah, thank you. Also, I the Star that <laughs> are you a Star Wars fan? Yeah, of course. Who isn't, you know? <laughs> Never know. I guess, yeah. <laughs> so I guess I guess if we had a reference to Star Wars, the answer was there. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we have, we have people uh, writing in the chat that they do know Spanish too. Ah, uh, good. So that, point out. that's cool. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. I mean, my questions are like uh, on a different topic to get to know you better also a little bit uh, 
different, right? This is a, a very yeah. special, uh, very special uh, kind of conference where you also get to learn about the person behind the signs. Exclusive interview. Yeah. Exclusive interview. You heard it here <laughs> first. So I want to ask you about the free food mailing list at IV at MIT, and uh, yeah, what is it? And <laughs> yeah, so there's this yeah. uh, mailing list at MIT where people just you know there are a lot of events for new students or whatever, and so people will just shout out on this mailing list if they have a bunch of leftovers. Um, and so for a while, I got really into it pre-COVID, especially. And I lasted a very long time on, on this mailing list without ever having to buy food. So that shows you how cheap I am, but it, it was great. How much, but, how long is a very long time? I made it a month without having to buy food. That was my longest stretch, but more typically it was like every a couple of weeks or something. Um, and it really varied, you know, at the beginning of the year when there are all these new student uh, like events, then it's, you don't ever have to buy food at all. It's great. And then towards the middle of the semester, everyone, you know, it dies down a bit, but uh, beginning of the semester is really profitable. Now, the real question is, was it healthy food or just donuts? <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of donuts, a lot of pizza. Pizza was very popular. Um, once though, I got like, I, I don't know, they, this event just didn't have like anyone show up, I guess. I got like two weeks worth of sandwiches and that was really, really nice. That was, and it's pretty, you know, better than pizza, I guess. Pretty yeah, healthy. totally. Uh, <laughs> more healthy. Yeah, <laughs> slightly. Maybe. Um, yeah. Okay, there's something else that I found really uh, interesting. It's that you're a fan of old maps and art. So yeah. how, how did you get into these hobbies and where do you find these old maps? Uh, so I got into maps, I don't know, like I had a relative give me a bunch of old uh, Nat Geo maps. I don't know why they had them, but, uh, and then I would go to Goodwill. I mean, I still do. I go to Goodwill or whatever, and if they have nice maps, I just I pick them up. And somehow while I was going to Goodwill for these maps or, you know, thrift shopping for these old maps, they also have like, I don't know, people have really strange art that they donate to these thrift stores for whatever reason. And it's just hard to say no when it's so bad, it's funny. So I had like very strange self-portraits for a long time, hanging like, not self-portraits of me, self-portraits of random people hanging in various places in my apartment. But yeah, not, not anymore. I, I moved recently and haven't put them back up yet. I must say that if they had been self-portraits of you, that would have been very strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I donate them and then I forget and then I re repick them up. <laughs> um, so I would say you're maybe a, a fan of secondhand art. And yeah, yeah. Thrift shopping for strange things, I think, is fun. Finding hidden treasures. Yeah, <laughs> treasures in quotation marks, but you know. <laughs> We have a ton of questions from people in the chat. So let me start with a question from uh, Crowbar Massage. Uh, the question is, uh, on the matrix of contextuality, once you measure, say, Z1, Z2, don't we lose the information in the qubits? And therefore, what does it mean to measure X1, X2, and Y1, Y2? Ah, good question. So uh, that plays into the point that I mentioned very briefly offhand which is that the rows and columns of these operators all commute. So in other words, if you're measuring, and, and you can check this yourself uh, just by matrix multiplication or if you know commutation relations of poly operators. Um, for instance, when doing Y1, Y2 and measuring along the row, because all these operators commute, in principle, you could do them simultaneously. Like uh, you don't lose any information when, well, you know, among, among these operators, at least, when, when doing these measurements. And then same when you measure along the column. Um, you can do x1, x2, and y1, y2 in any order because they commute and get the same measurement results. OK. OK. So great answer. Um, we have great question. <laughs> other questions. A lot of people thanking you for your talk. And Abby UBC 
uh, says, thanks, amazing talk. And are there any results on trainability of these restricted QNNs? Yeah, so that's another thing I, I need to do is actually prove that this model is trainable. Um, but numerically, it seems to be trainable and using intuition from the untrainable result proofs, this one seems like it would be trainable. Um, yeah, there again, there are proofs that are explicit that show the trainability of things like symmetric quantum neural networks, so things that obey many symmetries. Um, and so really, it's like kind of a this general trade-off of expressivity and trainability. Um, and because this is sort of lower on the expressivity uh, axis, it's, it's probably more trainable. And it seems to be numerically, so. Yeah, uh, it's hard, but unfortunate that sometimes you have those uh, trade-offs, right? You have to choose yeah. one or the other. Yeah, it, it keeps me a job, having a job though, you know, like uh, <laughs> I can do research on this. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes you can find these uh, hidden solutions that can help you bypass yeah. these constraints. Um, we have another question. Uh, well, we have a ton of them, but a question by warmu1127. Does the given contextual observables correspond to the hidden state input lambda in the CRNN model? So, uh, yeah, so it's uh, tempting to think of if a classical neural network were were to simulate this, that it must store every observable or whatever you're, you're measuring um, in a separate state in hidden space. Um, but our proof is totally agnostic to that. So we don't really care what the classical model is doing. It could be doing something crazy and trying to save memory by doubling up on internal representations. And we can act, in, in the paper, we give some like examples of things that look like you would need many uh, internal bits to store, but actually you don't, you can get away with uh, like a compressed internal representation. So it's, yeah, it, it it's very agnostic to that and it could be doing whatever and we don't know really. Um, it just, the proof says that no matter how it's internally storing these things, it's going to get something wrong when trying to translate something. So that's the general idea. That's good. That's good. Um, a question here from Moritz Wu. Uh, How does a problem of local minima in the loss landscape of shallow QNNs differ from classical QNN, uh, NNs? Couldn't concepts yeah. like momentum help solve that problem? Uh, so they can solve that problem if you have a very minor issue with local minima or bad saddle points. But it's just, it's really bad. Uh, so they, they get back to a picture of it. Um, this is some, I forget exactly what, some shallow quantum neural network projected along two uh, axes of parameters. And uh, it's just, you're, you're going to, even with momentum, it's going to take forever to get to this global minimum um, because you have to like escape out of so many local minima along the way. And I don't, I used to have this slide in here, but I don't anymore, which actually showed the, the concentration of local minima um, and how prevalent they are. And it's really bad. <laughs> it's way worse than, uh, than classical neural networks. And so unfortunately, yeah, like maybe, maybe, you know, for smaller examples, you can get away with just having a momentum term or using atom or something, but it, it doesn't scale well, um, unfortunately. Well, that's actually really good to know that you can try something like adding momentum or an atom optimizer. And maybe if your problem is not too bad, it could help. But yeah. if it is really bad, and much worse than classical, then then yeah, you you are in problem. Um, yeah. Okay, we have a an interesting question from Dantaki Kirby. What is your opinion on Markovian models like restricted Boltzmann machines uh, that use Gibbs sampling? Are autoregressive models simply better in every case? <laughs> I I'm biased uh, towards these kinds of models because I've done other research on it previously. I, I like them. Um, 
Yeah, they numerically seem to have the, the quantum versions of these models seem to have not so many issues in training. Um, and I have some ideas on showing that analytically, but I, I haven't gotten around to it. But um, yeah, definitely an interesting open question. Okay. Um, let's see uh, if we have more questions. Everybody keep asking your questions on the chat. Uh, so yeah, we have uh, two more minutes for questions. Um, we have a question by M Methaway 84. When you say deeper shallow circuits, do you mean the difference in depth or something else? Yeah, so uh, without getting technical, vaguely the way to think about it is uh, the number of layers of your quantum neural network. Um, and yeah, the, the requ actual requirements are a little more specific, but generally the way to think about it is if you have a model on n qubits and your depth, so the the number of layers you have in your quantum neural network is worse than log n. So it's deeper than logarithm of the number of qubits you have. Then you're going to be in this deep regime. Oops, oh this regime where you have uh, barren plateaus. And then on the other end of that, you'll be in this regime where you have local minimum minima. And I mean, there's a there's a bit of an overlap where you you actually have both, but uh, yeah, essentially that's where, without getting too technical, where the crossover happens. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Eric. This was really interesting. Uh, yeah, thanks. We learned a lot of uh, new things, uh, like personally learning about contextuality and the example you provided was super clear. It's uh, getting you the intuition. I know that it's not the mathematical definition, but sometimes that's exactly what we need to get the intuition yeah. of what you're talking exactly. about, what is happening behind. So uh, really excellent talk. I loved it. And everybody in the chat, over 180 people watching and enjoying your talk, and more people will watch the, the recording. Uh, so thank you again, Eric. Um, thank you. Our time is up for today, but we have one last talk. So everybody stay tuned. Eric, I'll say goodbye now. Thank <laughs> you.